So we're going to look at Kramer's rule next. So if AX equals B, and again, A is a matrix, X and B are going to be vectors. And so if you have this equation and A is invertible, the solution is unique. So there was some really big theorem of, I think, 14 properties that were all equivalent about matrices. And one of them was, if you have an invertible matrix, this uh, equation has one solution. That was one of those like 14 equivalent properties. Uh, but Kramer's rule gives us a way to find it relatively easily. Um, so if you have a unique solution, you will get a single vector with no free variables. So there'll be, let's say, n coordinates, you'll get uh, a unique vector solution right there. Um, and looking at each coordinate, you can, there's a nice formula for each coordinate that uses determinants. And I'm going to write a weird vector on top, which I'll explain in a minute, where this a sub i of b is a with column i replaced with b. So it's sort of weird. It's not a minor. It's remove a column. Well, it's really swap a column with the constant vector, that ve vector b. So we'll do an example. So this is Kramer's rule. And we're going to solve a very easy system using Kramer's rule. So we got x1 plus 2x2 equals 2. And negative x1 plus 4x2 equals 1. So we're going to solve using Kramer's rule. So first of all, we have to make sure our matrix A is invertible. Well, first of all, what is the problem with the way this is set up and Kramer's rule? Matrix. So we need a matrix. We need to re write it in matrix form. So it's written in, I guess, real linear equation form or syst linear system form. We need to turn it into matrix form. So we'll do that first. So we need to write it as AX equals B. So what is the A matrix? One, two, negative one, four. You've done this before. It's our coefficients right here. We don't know X right now. So X right now is just X1, X2. It has to be a vector of uh, in R2 because of the dimension of A. So just looking at the dimension of A, you can also look over and see, see oh, there's x1, x2. So two coordinates. And then what is the vector B? 2, 1. Two, one. All right. So let's write it out in the proper form. Ax equals B. 1, 2, negative 1, 4. x1, x2 equals... One. All right. So, what's the first thing I need to check before? Is it invertible? Is it invertible? What is one way to check if it's invertible? Also known as singular. What did we just learn yesterday? Apparently, not very much. If the determinant is not zero, 
we can invert it, just like real numbers. Zero is the only real number that does not have multiplicative inverse. So you take the determinant and figure out if it's zero or not. So it better not be zero or we're not going to be using Cramer's rule. So let's find the determinant of A first. And you're not wasting time here because this is part, if, if it's invertible, this is part of the solution. So this is part of the computation we have to do anyways. So we have one times four minus negative one times two. So that's four plus two is six. All right, so A is invertible. Now, if we look back at Kramer's rule, <clears throat> looking at what the xi's are going to be, what would be the problem? It's at the very top of the board here. What would be the problem if A was not invertible? We'd be dividing by zero. So if A's determine A is zero and you keep going with Kramer's rule, hopefully at some point you'll realize you're dividing by zero. And that's obviously it shouldn't be happening. So Kramer's rule would not apply in that case, but our determinant is six. So we're gonna do now, I'm just gonna write the x1 equals a1b determinant over determinant a. So we have to figure out what is a1b, and this is going to be a with column one replaced by b. So column one is going to go away and it's going to be replaced by two one. And I'll use a different color for this. So I use purple right there. So our column one is getting swapped out. So any questions on that matrix there? All we need to do is get the determinant now. So this is A one B. So let's get the determinant of A1, B. So we got two times four is eight minus two, which is six. So I can write down X1 is six over six, which is one. So I want you to find X2. So x2 is going to be a to b uh, determinant over determinant of a. a to b is a with column 2 replaced by b. All right, so find a to b, find the determinant, plug it in, and you can also check your x values by seeing if they work in our original system. So you should have gotten the A to B matrix is one, two, negative one, one. So we're just going to column two, removing column two and putting in the two, one right there. So our determinant will be three and X two will be that three over six, which is one half. So our solution will be one, one half. So 
So any questions on that, getting that number right there. So I did choose a easy two by two example. I could have done three by three and the process is exactly the same. So there'll be a few Kramer's rule questions on the homework. Hopefully I put some on that are bigger than two by two, but it's no different than what we just did. I just did this because hopefully we've done enough determinants that you see how to compute them. It just takes practice to do so. So the two by twos are super fast, three by threes a little slower, et cetera. So we're gonna look at some geometry now and how that relates to determinants. Let's start with the cross product. All right, cross product. The best way to think about cross product is a right hand rule. So we're going to look at that. All right, so as long as you have a right hand, you can demonstrate the right hand rule. So what you do, vector one is your first finger, not your thumb, but your first finger, your index finger. Vector two is your middle finger. And make sure you don't flick people off. So you're doing the sort of number one, not the greeting you might give somebody on the, who cuts you off. So like this, so first vector, second vector's behind first vector, meaning don't flick people off. All right, now your thumb is the cross product. So that's why it's called the right hand rule. All right, so take your right hand. Unfortunately, if you're right-handed, you can't write and use a right-hand rule, but that's all right, we're not writing right now. So first two fingers point straight ahead with index finger to your left with your middle finger, and then your thumb goes straight up. So this is if first vector and second vector are straight ahead directly to the left. So let's, uh, let's swap vectors. So when you swap vectors, you can't move your fingers to flick people off. I mean, you can, but that's not the right hand rule. All right, so how do you swap vectors? Remember where your two fingers are pointing. You have to move your arm, your wrist, your shoulder, but you can't move your, you can't change where your fingers are. So think about how to make your fingers point in, so your index finger should point to your left where your middle finger points. So here's one way to do it. I'm rotating my hand, but now my middle finger is pointing the wrong way. So what I'm gonna do is rotate 180 degrees so my middle finger points straight ahead now. So it's sort of upside down, rotated. All right, so this right here, the vectors are pointing the same way but they switched places. Which way is your thumb pointing now? Straight down. So we went from, let's go back to the original. So straight up, we swap the two vectors straight down. All right, so if you change the order, what's gonna happen, you'll get the negative vector. That's what's happening. Your thumb's going from up, thumbs up, to thumbs down. So if we change the order, we'll get negative. So that's the right hand rule. So we're gonna draw a right hand. If you're bad at drawing, you can just copy my drawing here. So I'll start with the thumb, and then first finger. So, uh, that's not a good finger. There we go, first finger, second finger. All right, your last two fingers you're not using, so I'll just draw them right there, curled up. So even if you're a Ninja Turtle, you can still do the right hand rule, it's no problem. All right, so those are your fingers. Now we're gonna label it V1, V2, and then the thumb is V1 cross V2. And the cross product looks just like an X. So that's a very good reason to not use X when you're going to use a cross product, because it's going to look just like a cross product. So I recommend for vectors, generally try to use like V whenever you can, U, sometimes W. Those are good vector letters. You can use X or Y if you have to, but definitely not if you're going to do a cross product. All right, so we're going to look at some rules here. So. V1 across V2 is going to be perpendicular or orthogonal 
to both v1 and v2. So a cross product is orthogonal to both the original vectors. And we just discovered this property by rotating our hands around. So if I change the order, I'll get a negative sign. Does anybody know what this property is called? It's almost commutative, so we call it anti-commutative. So if you commute, you get the opposite vector. So we call that anti-commutative. Uh, some algebraic properties, alpha times a cross product. You can move, just like any other product, you can move the scalar around. So the scalar can be commuted and associated. So you could just scale the first vector, or you could just scale the second vector. And that's going to be the same thing as scaling the cross product. So I'm going to erase what I'm about to write in red, but I just want to warn you So we call it a product for good reason. You can't distribute products across products. How could I change the left side to make this true? So what scalar can I put here to make this true? Alpha squared. So there's alpha times alpha, alpha squared. So if I wanted to do this, that would be alpha squared. That would be the way to do this right here. Now if I change it to addition, then you can distribute across addition, but you don't distribute across multiplication. Any type of product, doesn't matter. You don't distribute products across products. All right, so I'm just gonna erase this right here. All right, so how do we compute this? Here is how we're gonna, and this is only in three-dimensional space. So right-hand rule, only in R3. So if you're in R2, there's no cross product. If you're in R4, there's no cross product or any other dimension. It's only, it's unique to dimension three. So here's how we're gonna compute it. We're gonna set up a determinant. We're gonna put i, j, k in the first row. Second row will be vector one. Third row will be vector two. So you're just going to write the vector across the row like this. So these vectors are going to be three dimensions, so there'll be three components. So it'll line up perfectly in this three by three matrix. And when you expand this, what you're going to do is use row one expansion. So it's going to be I times the two by two minor that you would get. It would be right down here. But so the minor you're going to get is here. I'll try to highlight it a couple times. That's the minor, but I don't have entries written in there, so I can't really write the entries over here in the matrix. So we still get the sign changing. So it's minus J times the other minor, the determinant of the other minor, plus K times the determinant of the third minor. Well, I can write the minor out. So this will be M11, M12, row one, column two, and then M13, row one, column three. What happens if I swap two rows in the determinant? Mm. Makes, it Makes it negative. Somewhere up here, we wrote these rules down. Here we go. Row swap, so we're the first purple uh, point up there. If B is A with one row swap, then sign changes to negative. So if we think about the cross product here, the equivalent of making a row swap right here would be changing the order of the cross product, and that would make it negative. So that property will uh, still work. 
All right, so this is cross products right here. So let's look at area of a parallelogram. So area of a parallelogram with with sides u and v and this is in R3 so I'll draw a parallelogram well I'll first just draw two vectors u and v as long as these vectors are not zero there should be one parallelogram formed here so all you do is make two more sides that are parallel so I'm making a copy of u and then a copy of V. And there's our parallel vector, right, or our parallelogram right there. So we had our original two sides, and you just complete the parallelogram. So we want to get the area of this. Area is going to be U cross V, and then take the, uh, oh, this will be the magnitude. So cross product of a vector is a vector and you're going to take the magnitude of the vector. So we're doing magnitude of the vector u cross v. And if we want area of a triangle, with sides U and V in R3. All right, how would I turn two vectors, two non-zero vectors, into a triangle? with sides u and v. Obviously I could make this triangle, but my bottom side is, no, I don't ha no longer have a side that's v if I make this triangle. Can you do the magnitude of u times v over two? Just get half of the parallelogram. So think of the parallelogram, but instead of making it into a parallelogram, we're gonna turn it into a triangle. So we're just sealing off the front of one vector to the front of the other vector. All right. How does this relate to the parallelogram? It's half, that's it. So we're gonna do half the area that we got before. So the, the full parallelogram would have extended out, but we only want half of the parallelogram, also known as a triangle. So this area is one half magnitude u cross v. So if u and v are in R2, you can still get a cross product. But you have to do it in R3. So what we're going to do is called an injection or a, no, we're not, it would be an immersion, not a submersion. So what we're going to do is take these vectors and from R2 and put them into R3. We're going to do it in a very easy way. So think of, let's say the floor or the tops of our tables are all flat and that's two dimensional space. So the top of your table is two dimensional space. Now, our table's inside the classroom, which is three-dimensional space. So just put your pencil on the table, or pen. So you have two-dimensional vector now. What, so it has an X and a Y coordinate, 
if you had to pick a z coordinate, what would you choose for your z coordinate? Zero. Zero. Very good. So that's how we're going to embed these vectors in three dimensional space. We're just going to give them a, a z coordinate of zero. So the way we could write it is like this r2 into r3. So we're going to take our vector, uh, we'll go a, a, b, and we're going to send that to a, comma, b, comma, zero. And now you can find cross product of a two dimensional, uh, two two dimensional vectors. All right, so I'm going to take out a second pencil, put it on the table, and we're going to use a right hand rule. So line them up so you can pick whichever one's one, whichever one you want to be as vector two. Make sure they're not parallel. I'll talk about parallel in a second. What happens if you cross parallel vectors? So make sure they're not parallel. Line up your fingers, vector one, vector two. Where does your thumb point, no matter how you lined up your vectors? It's either going to point straight up. What's the other option? Straight down. So those are the two options. You're either going to get a vector that's going to go straight up, meaning it's going to have a z component, and its x and y components will be 0. Or it'll go straight down. The z component won't be 0, and the x and y will be 0. So that's what's going to happen when you cross two vectors in R2, they're going to only have a coordinate in the third position. The other two should be zero because they need to be perpendicular to the original, the plane the original two vectors were on. So that's how you can cross a vector in R2 with another vector in R2. You just basically throw them into three-dimensional space using this right here. And then you're going to get a third vector when you cross them that will uh, point directly out of that plane they were in. All right, so we know all about, we should probably do at least one example of a cross product before we just zoom right back to eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So let's do one cross example. So we're going to cross 312 and negative 205. The way we're going to do this, the only way I've showed you is i, j, k in the first row, then 312 in the second row, negative 205 in the third row. And I strongly recommend your life will be a lot easier if you go expanding across the first row because that will keep your i's, j's, and k's separated. Otherwise, you're going to have to reshuffle everything when you're done and get your i's, j's, and k's separated out. So always go, even though there's a zero down at the bottom, just go row one when you're doing a cross product. So get this cross product here. You got any questions?
Any questions on this calculation? Five, negative 19, two. No questions? All right. So cross product is impossible if you don't know what you're doing. When you've done maybe five, six, seven of them, it's incredibly easy. So you just need practice, that's all. So now we're going to get back to eigenvalues and vectors now that we know how to compute determinants. So let's switch to a new section. We'll call this, we'll call it eigenvectors, I guess. We already have one called eigenvalues. Eigenvalues and vectors have the proper, so eigenvalues are going to be lambdas, eigenvectors will be uh, x in this case. So here's our original equation. You have an eigenvalue and vector pair if multiplying by a is the same as multiplying by a scalar. So we saw that happen before, and we did this subtraction. We wanted to factor out x. But what was a problem factoring like this? It looks okay algebraically, but what's the issue? You can't subtract a vector or a matrix by a scalar. So that's what we're doing here. So that would be illegal. So the way we fix it is just put the right identity matrix in there. All right, from here, so we want to have one or more free variables in this solution. Well, so let's, let's look, what would happen if we get exactly one solution here? Let's say for a given lambda, there's only a trivial x that make, if we get a solution, if there's only one solution, it has to be x equals zero, the zero vector. Because we have uh, a matrix multiplied by a vector equaling zero, you are automatically get the trivial solution. What we want is non-trivial solution. So the way we're gonna get that, a non-trivial solution only comes out of free variables, one or more free variables. So we want a non-trivial solution, which arises from one or more free variables. So let's think back to that huge theorem on invertible matrices. It probably took up almost a full page in your notes. I'm going to go back to that theorem. Hopefully it's in the determinant section. Let's see. Nope. Nope, vector spaces. Here we go, fundamental theorem of invertible matrices. Oh no. All right, so all these are equivalent. The one that we have, so we have C, or I should say what we have, what we want is not C. So I'll zoom in a little closer. 
I do not want there to be only the trivial solution. So I want not C. What we're going to do is look at not A right there. So we want that matrix A minus lambda I to be not invertible. So what does that mean about the determinant? Zero. So I want it to be zero. So I'm going to take the determinant, set it equal to zero, solve for lambda. That's our process here. And the reason because of this theorem right there. So I want not the trivial solution, which is equivalent to not invertible. So this happens exactly when a minus lambda i is not invertible. Which is the same as determinant a minus lambda i equals zero. So we're forcing it to be singular. That's another way to say this. We want to find what lambda values make this singular. So a minus lambda i, the determinant of that is called the characteristic polynomial. And when you set this polynomial equal to zero, it's called the characteristic equation. So I'm going to write down the steps for finding uh, the eigenspace. Well, I'll just call it the eigenstuffs. So there's the eigenvalue, which we'll find first, the eigenvector, which we'll find second, and the eigenspace, which we'll find third. So that's what I mean by eigenstuffs. There's three eigen things we're going to find. So one, find zeros of characteristic, characteristic polynomial. So it'll be P of lambda equals A minus lambda I equals zero. So we're gonna solve that for lambda. Two, for each lambda, so for each eigenvalue, we're going to find null of a minus lambda i. So again, that's the null space. And we, we're going to call this e lambda. We used that notation before. That's the eigenspace of the lambda value. So it's a little strange, we're gonna find the eigenspace first, and then the basis for the eigenspace, those basis vectors are gonna be your eigenvectors. So third. So find a basis for each lambda. And the basis vectors will 
will be the eigenvectors. So we find the eigenvalue first, then the eigenspace, and then the basis for the eigenspace will be the eigenvectors. So this is important. Let's go ahead and put a box around it. Take an easy vector, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Easy meaning there's lots of zeros. 2, negative 5, 4. All right, step 1. We want to find A minus lambda I. So we'll find this factor first, then take the determinant and set it equal to 0. What dimension does the identity have to be? Three by three. So it just has to be whatever dimension your uh, matrix A is. So I'm going to multiply the lambda into this matrix, so we're going to get negative lambdas down the diagonal. You may want to space, give yourself more horizontal space when you're doing these because you're going to have some subtractions going on. So you want to be a little careful. The bottom right entry is 4 minus lambda. So you want to make sure that you space them out nicely. You could put vertical bars going down if that to separate your columns out, if that helps out. All right, so there's our a minus lambda i. Now we're going to get determinant. Alright, so I'll let you pick the row. What row looks good? I think row one's good. Row two works just as well, but if there's a choice and they're both the same, I would just go row one. So if you can go row one, just do row one. So we'll expand on row one here. So remember, there's no try, there's only do. Don't worry about the lambda. Just treat it like normal. So we don't need the third minor because our third coefficient is zero. So that whole thing will just be zero. All right, so now we just have some two by twos to take care of. So we have negative lambda times four minus lambda minus five, uh, negative five times one, which is plus five, minus zero minus two. algebra questions or linear algebra questions. <laughs> We're really just doing algebra at this point though. So you should get a polynomial with the same degree as your dimension. 
So we had three by three, so there basically should be a product of three lambdas and lower powers of lambda as well. So you should expect the same degree as your dimension. All right, we're setting this equal to zero now. So set this equal to zero. How in the world do we solve for lambda? Oh no, we have to go way back to basic algebra. So factor, that'll work if we're lucky. I like the high power term in front, so I'm going to put the lambda cube in front. I also like my leading term to be positive, so I'm going to multiply by negative one on both sides. Make it positive. I'm going to briefly write this with x's. You can actually turn a lambda into an x quite easily. Just add a little extra bit up top. It's very easy to make a lambda an x. All right, you could ask my pre-calculus one students how to solve this. What would they tell you? So we might, we may need to do long division. How would we know what factor you even divide by? How would we find our first zero? Set x to zero, or zero will give us negative two. Um, if I didn't have a constant term, then x equals zero would be one solution. All right, rational zero theorem, obviously. So we're gonna use a rational zero theorem here. All right, rational zero theorem, you're gonna take factors of the constant coefficient divided by factors of the leading coefficient. So rational zero theorem says if your polynomial coefficients, so if poly coefs are integers and if there is a rational zero, then the zero is x equals p over q, where p is a factor of constant coefficient. is a factor of the leading coefficient. All right, I'm going to do all this with lambdas instead of x's. I just wrote down x's, so it would be less scary. But a lambda is just a letter. Well, it's a letter from the Greek alphabet, but that's just as good as our alphabet. All right, our leading coefficient is one, constant coefficient is two, so potential rational zeros are going to be, there's gonna be plus or minus, well, I'll just write factors of two divided by factors of one. So good news is two is prime, so there's two factors, one, there's only one factor, which is one. So for two, we have one and two, for one, we only have one. So all combinations will look like one over one or two over one, which of course we can reduce down to one or two. 
and there's going to be a plus or minus. So we're going to try both positive and negative one, positive and negative two. Try the easy ones first, then go to the more difficult ones. So one and two really aren't that difficult, but we'll just start with one. Oh, looks like we'll stop. Time flies when you're doing regular algebra.